What is the Lord doing here? He's assaulting the Jews with concepts that leave them mentally reeling in order to shake them loose from their preoccupation with temporal sustenance and blessing, trying to raise their minds to spiritual truths. First, he speaks of himself as coming down from the Father in heaven. Then, he speaks of himself in terms that make absolutely no sense from a purely earthbound perspective. What does he mean here? Unfortunately, many, including those among his disciples, were left so completely bewildered by Christ's preaching that, as St. John writes in verse 66, they went back and walked with him no more. And this is a hard saying, they lamented. Who can understand it? As we read in verse 60. To those who will listen to him, Jesus explains what they have to grasp in their hearts in order to understand him. He says, and again here we are at verse 63, It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit, and they are life. As I say, this is the verse that we identified at the outset. Many non-sacramental Christian believers use it to debunk the ancient apostolic teaching that the bread and wine of the Eucharist are the literal body and blood of Christ. Again, they take Jesus to say here that there is no real importance to his flesh. It is his words alone, his teachings, that are spiritual and therefore life-giving. There are many problems with this interpretation, however. First of all, Having gone now through the chapter and examined the verse's context, I think it is eminently clear how we should understand it. When Jesus says that the flesh profits nothing, he is speaking clearly to that total preoccupation with temporal earthly needs that the Jews who followed him to Capernaum demonstrated. These people were looking for breakfast. They saw Jesus as an everlasting meal ticket one who could satisfy their physical needs. And everything he said to them about who he is and what he comes to offer, they heard in the context of those fleshly desires. The Lord had attempted to elevate their hearts by speaking of heavenly spiritual things. Which is the second flaw in the interpretation of those who take this verse as debunking the real presence. Verse 63's spiritual life-giving words that I speak, quote-unquote, include all these words that Jesus just spoke about eating his body and drinking his blood. And in those spiritual words, Jesus certainly isn't saying that his flesh profits nothing. He says it profits eternal life. Could we expect Jesus to ever say that his flesh is unprofitable? The most glorious truth in the universe is that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. John 1.14 Believing that the Son of God has taken on human flesh is a test of faith for a Christian. As we read in 1 John 4.3 And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. The only way that verse 63 can be used to contest the doctrine of the real presence is if one completely isolates it from the context of the chapter and applies a very platonic, dualistic interpretation to it. In that case, flesh is interpreted as that which is material, and spirit is defined as rational. In the Platonized Christianity of the West, the material is ultimately meaningless. Only the rational is of value. But as we have seen, there is absolutely nothing in the context or the content of verse 63, nor anything in the scriptures as a whole, I might add, to suggest this Platonic slant on Jesus' words. There is nothing to suggest that in the preceding verses, Jesus is not inviting us to partake of his actual body and blood. Some platonic, but he just can't mean that, is not enough to deny the real presence in the Eucharist. Now, of course, 
There's also nothing in these verses that tells us specifically that they must be taken literally. As I pointed out in the beginning, the evidence for holding that they must is written in the historical experience of the church. But I believe it's also written in the truth of the Incarnation. I'm coming to think that the real resistance to the doctrine of the real presence is grounded in the rather impoverished view of the Incarnation widely embraced by Western Christian churches. For the West, Christ comes in the flesh just to provide a body for the receiving of God's wrath upon sinners. But the ancient church and the Christian East know that the purpose of Christ's incarnation is to join humanness to divinity. He comes to restore us to union with God on every level of our human existence, the physical as well as the spiritual. At baptism, the Holy Spirit of God comes to dwell within us. In the depths of our inward nature, Christ unites our spirits with His Spirit. By offering His body and blood to us, His literal body and blood to us in the Eucharist, Christ establishes the same intimate connection between the human flesh He now bears and our bodies. Jesus Christ is not a rational philosophy. The living faith he brings to us is much more than spiritual principles we are to hear and apply to our lives. It is rather the joining of our beings with his. This is the truth that fundamentally divides Christians who believe in the real presence of Christ's body and blood in the Eucharist and those who don't. It is only their rational platonic mindset which makes John 6.63 an anti-Eucharistic verse in the minds of Western believers. My prayer is that God would bring all to the living knowledge of Christ and an experience of the communion cup that joins them, body and spirit, to the incarnate Son of God. For Ancient Faith Radio, this is Matthew Gallatin. If you'd like more information on Matthew Gallatin's ministry, visit his website at matthewgallatin.com. That's matthewgallatin.com. This has been a listener-supported presentation of Ancient Faith Radio.